By the way, Tom missed, did you see on the introduction stuff? He said I had written three books on suffering. Now, if Tom had taken my classes, he would know that I have written three books on the glory of God. It does not say the cup and the suffering. It does not say the darkness and the suffering. It does not say the stone and suffering. It actually talks about the glory of God. It ties in to what Steve Lawson said last night. So anyway, on the bio sheet for that, that I have written three books on suffering. I didn't write that. Uh, that is... <laughs> I'm going to add that one to my long list. Uh, I wish I could tell you the different introductions that I've had, uh, things that people have said, uh, mostly good, but golly, from being an All-American basketball player at the University of North Carolina, <laughs> they come up, I had no twice on that one. Uh, never have I ever told anybody that. So anyway, just a little side note with this. Now we are in Acts chapter 12 and we have walked our way up to where we have actually met the author of the book that we will be studying. At least his name was mentioned. Peter was let out of prison. So again, we are in Acts chapter 12. That's going to be our launching pad. We might as well do verses 11 and 12 just to kind of lead into this. And when Peter came to himself, he says, now I know for sure that the Lord has sent me forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. John is his Jewish name, and Mark is going to be his Gentile name. It's not unusual in scripture for people to have two names, such as Simon slash Peter, Saul slash Paul, not everybody, Levi slash Matthew. It's not unusual for people to have different names in there. You will never technically see John Mark uh, put together. It's always going to be separated somewhere, although some people say this is John Mark, and again, that's partly true. John to be again the Jewish name, and Mark or Marcus would be the Gentile name. And so with this, look what takes place just to kind of, we're not going to do every aspect of this. Dropping down to the end of chapter 12, a couple of verses we need to note with, verse 24, but the word of the Lord continued to grow. This is after God had smote Herod, the word of God began to continue to grow and be multiplied. And then in verse 25, And Barnabas and Saul, by this time Saul has no longer become Saul the Pharisee, now he is Saul the Christian. He will eventually become the Apostle Paul, but he is saved and he is with Barnabas. Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission that was given to them in different contexts, taking along with them, verse 25, John, who was also called Mark. So there's our second reference to our author of the book that we're going to be in in just a bit. But we need to look at chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. This is the first missionary journey. Acts 13 and 14 is the first missionary journey, first of three for the Apostle Paul. And so in chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, and they were at Antioch. This would be on the, oh, back towards Jerusalem, up towards the uh, coast. There were at in Antioch, that church there, prophets and teacher, teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, the Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. Just for the record, this was a multi-ethnic church uh, in the early part. Nothing wrong, I mean, praise God, multi-ethnic churches, praise God. If you're or in a, places I went to in Kenya, I was the only white person within 100 miles that I knew of. But this was one that, this one happened to be a multi-ethnic church. And while they were ministering to the Lord in verse 2 and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart... For me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. 
And so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. From there, they sailed to Cyprus. And when they had reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And then look at this last part in chapter 13, verse 5. And they also had John as their helper. And this particular John is also Mark. This is not John the Apostle with a context that we saw earlier. This is John, Jewish name, Mark, Gentile name. You could read the rest of the part of chapter 13, but just for time's sake for us, we need to do this. There was a, well, chapter 13, verse 13. Now Paul and his companions put out from the sea from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. And then look at this last part. If you mark your Bibles, this is an important one. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now there is no explanation given by God of why this took place. All that we can do is conjecture. We will have to wait until we get to heaven to see what that was. Was he too young and did he get homesick? Was it just the first opposition of the gospel and he wanted to return to Jerusalem? We're not told. But for whatever reason, he decided that this was not for him. And so he left and went back home. Now, in chapter 15, as we're walking our way over, we're headed to the Gospel of Mark. But in chapter 15, you have the Jerusalem Council. And we know when this was. This was in A.D. 49. So, if Jesus was crucified in A.D. 30, I'll let people work this out. The mathematicians say it's either 30, A.D. 30 or A.D. 33. I was an English lit major. I have no idea. That's one. I sit on the sideline and I listen to the scholars debate it. But somehow it works out either 80-30. I think that's what John MacArthur holds. And 80-33 is what some others hold. And so if, let's just say 80-30 was the crucifixion. This is 19 years. So by this time, Acts 10 has taken place. The Gentiles have received the gospel. But if you're Jewish people, because again, Acts 1 through 7, the church is totally Jewish. What do you do with these people? What do you do with the Gentiles? In Acts chapter 15, there were two different problems. Here's the first one, John chapter 15, verse 1. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, according to the Mosaic covenant, look at what they say. You cannot be saved. Now, ladies, fortunately, this is a male thing in this particular regard. Circumcision was a Jewish thing for the males, supposed to be on the eighth day, by God's grace, when they were a baby, for the eighth day. If you're an older man and you are circumcised, you would remember it for the rest of your life. Flint knives and stuff. Oh, my goodness. Joshua, before they entered the land. Oh, goodness. Ooh, Joshua chapter 5. We won't go there. All right, but here's what they're saying in, in chapter 15, verse 1. Look at what they say. You cannot be saved, males. Unless you're circumcised under the law of Moses. That's a very important issue. So does a Gentile have to become a Jew in order to be saved? And you can read the rest of the chapter, but chapter 15, verse 5, here's the second part of this. But certain ones of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them, salvation-wise, and, look at this, to direct them to observe the law of Moses. So, are you saved by, or or in other words, with, with Gentiles? Do Gentiles have to become Jews in order to be saved? And do they have to live as Jews in order to be sanctified? And this is what the Jerusalem Council determines. It cracks me up. You can read the rest of this. How's this for a name dropping in verse 28? For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to write this. I mean, you're dropping a good name when you say, the Holy Spirit and us say this. Now, technically, the Holy Spirit is telling them exactly right. In other words, what the Holy Spirit tells them. For you Gentiles, you do not have to become a Jew in order to be saved. You do not have to live as a Jew in order to be sanctified. 
Some time on your own if you want to. Go to the book of Galatians, chapters 1 and 2. Paul comes out swinging, you Galatians. The Judaizers had come in and told them you are not saved unless you basically are circumcised and following the law. To such a degree that even Peter was affected by this. That Peter used to eat with Gentiles and then when some of the Jewish people came down, Peter withdrew, how's that for one, in the body of Christ. And Paul, little Paul, said, I got on a peach basket. I added that part. I got on a peach basket. Most of you don't even know what a peach basket is. I got on a peach basket and I accosted him face to face because he stood wrong. And he said, you couldn't keep the law. We couldn't. And you're putting this bondage, this burden on Gentiles. So in chapters 1 and 2, Paul comes out in Galatians about establishing his own apostleship. That's where I'm crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20, some of you had that verse memorized, no longer I to live. Not saved by becoming a Jew. You don't live as a Jew afterwards. That's what Galatians deals with. That's what the Jerusalem Council dealt with. Now all of that, why are we doing this? Because in chapter 15, verse 36... After the Jerusalem council basically told the Gentiles, you're doing fine. And stay away from fornication, stay away from things strangled, don't drink blood, things along those lines. Other than that, we wish you well. They didn't have the New Testament written then. They didn't have the finished word of God. So in chapter 15, verse 36, some days after the Jerusalem council, in Acts 15, verse 36, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see that they are. Let me put this in paraphrase. Let's go back to the churches that we did in Acts 13 and Acts 14. Let's go back to the first missionary journey churches and let's see how they are doing. That's Paul's idea. Barnabas said, verse 37, Barnabas, great was desirous of taking, look at this, John called Mark along with them. That was Barnabas' idea. Look at Paul's response, verse 38. But Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along, who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. This is making reference again to what? Mark did in Acts 13, verse 13, where he abandoned them. He deserted them. He went back to Jerusalem. And so Barnabas says, "Looks great. Let's go back. Let's visit the churches of Acts 13 and 14, and let's take Mark. And Paul insisted, strongly insisted. We can't take the one who has deserted us. We can't take it with the work. We can't take him to this work. Look what it does in verse 39. There arose such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now, beloved, this is an account in Acts 15, verses 36 through 39. This is an account where godly people disagree about different things. It doesn't say who was right, and it doesn't say who was wrong in this particular case. Barnabas had his reasons for wanting to take Mark along with them. Paul had his reasons for not wanting to have Mark on the trip with them. You will never find in the Bible Paul saying anything bad about Barnabas. And we don't have the book of Barnabas. Barnabas was a son of exhortation. May God raise up many sons and daughters of exhortation in your life, encouraging people in your life. I promise you this, there will be enough people going in the opposite direction. So Barnabas, son of exhortation, praise God for such men and women. But this is one example where godly people can disagree about something and go different directions. You do it prayerfully. You do it without character assassination. And this is not a doctrinal matter. 
This is not something that is a commandment in scripture. This is a personal judgment call. And they handled it real well with this. But the bottom line with this is that Barnabas and Mark went one way and Paul went the other way. So the other two missionary journeys, Paul is not going to be a part of. Now, what happens with this? We just have gaps in scripture and we have to fill in. We, I'm headed over to 1 Peter chapter 5. You're welcome to follow along with me if you like. We don't understand until we get to heaven the full story we see in a mirror dimly. 1 Peter chapter 5 Towards the end of this, this wonderful, beloved epistle of First Peter. First Peter chapter 5, verse 12 and verse 13. Through Silvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. If you were here Saturday night, you may remember that. From our, our time together in God's word, being in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you greeting. There's questions and scholars debate whether that's talking about really our people in Babylon, the church in Babylon that was there, or whether Babylon is kind of a symbolic reference to, to Rome. I wouldn't sever fellowship. I'm not sure. I'll go ahead and tell you. I'll wait till I get home to be with the Lord about that. But all of that to get down to the last part of verse 13, they send you greetings. And look at this. Look how Peter describes them. So does my son, Mark. Now, obviously, this is not a physical sign. But Peter is going to have a substantial relationship in Mark's life. To such an extent, Paul referred to Timothy as my son in the faith, Philippians 2. Mark would be said the same thing, let me reword that. Peter says the same thing in regard to Mark. He is my son in the faith. That's how Peter regarded him. Aren't you glad? Chapter 13, verse 13, where Mark abandoned and went back, that the story doesn't end there. This is a good thing. This shows that Mark is walking with the Lord. Mark repented, whatever degree that repentance was necessary. Mark had grown by that time. Mark had not denied the name of Christ. He was very much involved with the ministry that Peter was involved with. I can't wait to find out what Peter was doing. Of all the people that you would think would write, 10 to 20 books in the Bible, you think it would be Peter. I mean, after he was released, released from prison in the Acts 12 account, he kind of fades from the scene. We'll find out in heaven what he has been doing. Paul becomes more and more prominent in the book of Acts with this. And of course, Peter only writes eight chapters, but they are loaded chapters, wonderful chapters, all in accordance with. But wouldn't you love to have the gospel of Peter? Wouldn't you love to have kind of the full story? A lot of times students will say, why don't we have more information in the Bible? And the answer is, when you go to seminary, you would not ask that when you have tests and quizzes and things to memorize. God's given us everything related to life and godliness according to the magnificent promises of his word. But we don't have the full story yet. These are big, big gaps. So let's add a few more verses before we work our way over to the gospel of Mark. I'm headed over to Colossians chapter 4, Genesis, Exodus, Colossians, here we go, chapter 4. This is a very explanatory verse with this. In chapter 4 of Colossians, verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sent you his greetings, and also Barnabas' cousin, Mark. Well, thump my pumpkin. Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. That's an Americanism. Well, thump my pumpkin. Well, what do you know? In Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, Barnabas' cousin, Mark. This is why, in Colossians 4, 10, this is why... Barnabas was so insistent, among other reasons, 
of taking Mark along with him on the second missionary journey because Barnabas was his cousin. We wouldn't know that without Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. Now, Philemon, if you keep going from Colossians, just go over a few more. You can either, when you go to Titus, if you turn the page over to Philemon, Again, feel free. These are some books that may not be as familiar to some of you. Nothing wrong with using the index. Ross did it all the time in class. We would say turn to Genesis chapter 1. Ross wouldn't have a clue where in the world that was. We'd all patiently wait till he went down the index and find us. So do nothing wrong with use the table of contents if you need to to find these books. Now, man, and Philemon, in this particular time, Acts 28, Paul is in prison in Rome. And he wrote Colossians and Philemon, he wrote Ephesians, wrote Philippians. But look what Paul does. He describes himself, verse first, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, not necessarily the Roman Empire. I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. That's how he viewed it. Even though the Roman Empire was the one that imprisoned him, as far as he was concerned, he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. But here's what he says, verse 23. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you. Look at verse 24. As do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. So, by this particular time, by the time that Acts 28 rolls around, not only has Mark become a son in the faith to Peter, Paul's estimation of Mark has changed as well. We'll put it this way. Mark has shown himself faithful. This is wonderful to use. Now, beloved, there are things that absolutely can disqualify somebody from the ministry on a permanent basis. But Mark's life is an example of someone who failed, who repented, that God built up, that God made into a useful vessel. Considered to be fellow workers with Luke. That's pretty good company, wouldn't you think? Considered to be fellow workers with the Apostle Paul. That's pretty good company with this. I am so glad people didn't know me as a baby Christian. Glad they didn't have recording devices. Glad my early sermons are not recorded. Other than what God and the angels laughed at. I'm glad that dumb things that I did, said, thought, wrote, whatever, are not recorded for everybody to read. Mark's life, not everything in there. But his failure was there. But when you go through scripture, praise God. He failed, but not failed to the extent. In fact, let's just do one more with this. Over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 is Paul's death row epistle. By this time, he has already been let out in Acts chapter 28. He's there for two years. He's let out. He said, when he wrote the book of Romans, he said, I want to go to Spain. We have no idea if he ever made it to Spain. I have no idea. We'll find out and get to heaven. He was in prison before. He was let out for a little while. He wrote 1 Timothy then. He wrote Titus then. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 4 on his death row epistle. Here's what he writes to Timothy and to the church. Boy, this is a love letter and a, and a very precious one. As a baby Christian, I did not like the Apostle Paul. Didn't like him. Peter, I loved. If I could relate with Peter, wanting to do the right thing and often not, wanting to say the right thing and often blowing it. As far as I was concerned, the Apostle Paul was just too hardcore, too straightforward, too driven, and all this stuff. He was a brilliant individual. I had to do the arguments as part of my doctor's degree at Dallas Theological Seminary. And the arguments, you had to do the background of the book, historical background, had to come up with an explanatory outline, a very detailed outline. And you have to argue the logic of the book. Mine turned out to be about a thousand pages by the time that I was done. 
Sometimes I have students in class say, I wrote a 25-page paper. And I'll just <laughs> cut it. It's good, it's good, it's real good. Rub them on the head. It's a little bozo, we don't know nothing. And so, <laughs> um, it was such a large project. I sat, the computers were just starting. They were cranked like lawnmowers, had a full handle. That's how old the things were. But this was such a large project. I sat in front of my computer for an hour before getting started with this, trying to get my arms around this mentally. How do you do this? How do you do 66 books, the Bible? It was such a massive project. Literally, I sat there, kind of fallen as a dead man, sat there, stared at the computer for an hour. And after that hour, it's like, all right, let's do it. And what happens is you do it a chunk at the time. And you work your way through. It took about a year and a half to do that. But I did mine. You didn't have to do it. You could do it in whatever order you wanted to. You just had to turn it in to have from Genesis through Revelation. But I did mine. I did the Apostle Paul's letters. There's a debate among scholars whether Galatians is first or First Thessalonians is the first epistle. I wouldn't sever fellowship on this. If somebody said Galatians or First Thessalonians, I wouldn't sever fellowship. I don't know. I think it's Galatians that has to be what I'd hold, but dear God, leave me on to take a different position. All it is is a matter which came first, Galatians or first Thessalonians. So I started there. By the time I came to Second Timothy chapter four, I had picked up a friend in the Apostle Paul. And even though this is roughly two thousand years, give or take, removed from the time that he died. I dreaded coming to 2 Timothy because this is his death row epistle. And he is getting ready to die. And he is going to be kind of out of my life because he had been such in my life for a matter of months. I had worked through the different epistles. And I dreaded 2 Timothy as I would dread the pending death of, of, of a loved one. I can't wait to find out in heaven what happened with this. Timothy is not with Paul, obviously, when Paul wrote the second Timothy. We don't know if Timothy made it before Paul is beheaded. Peter was crucified, as Jesus said in John 21. Paul, as a Roman citizen, would never be crucified because he was beheaded. I don't think Paul dreaded that after all he had been through by that time. It's kind of like, <sighs> and by the way, he didn't die. He entered into the glory of God. Now, with this, though, we don't know if Timothy, well, look what he says. Verse 9, chapter 4, in this last chapter that he wrote, make every effort to come to me soon, Timothy. And we don't know if Timothy made it. I mean, did Timothy make it and then watch Paul be executed and then have to deal with that? Or did God protect Timothy? So by the time that Timothy got there, this was already done. And then Timothy would just deal with the grief. We don't know. I, I can't wait to find out. We don't know if Timothy made it because God doesn't tell us with us. Most people don't name their kid, verse 10, Demas. They are Christians. I have never run into a Demas and had a Demas as a student. Demas, having loved this present world, you may want to go back over if I leave in 23, Demas was one of the ones mentioned along with Mark and Luke. Boy, what a designation. Demas, having loved this present world, have deserted me. Did what Mark did in Acts chapter 13, verse 13. Demas, having loved this present world. I bet you to whatever degree, now just real, real quickly with this, this doesn't mean that Demas wasn't saved. He may or may not have been. We'll find out when we get to heaven. He may have had a lapse in faith and abandoned temporarily and came back. If he did, he would have loss of reward. If he's a child of God, he's a child of God. He would have loss of reward for what he did. But if he never was returned to the fold, that he never was a child of God to begin with. He didn't lose his salvation for stepping away and deserting. He deserted because he never was saved. That's Judas never was saved. 
And we don't know. That's one God didn't give us information. Demons, having loved this present world, has deserted and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. And look what he says. Pick up Mark and bring him with you. For he is useful to me for service. Is this the same Mark of chapter 13 of Acts? Yes, it is in a way. I mean, same individual. But he's grown by this time. And these are decades of walking with the Lord. If I am Mark, I mean, this is a Holy Spirit-inspired letter that Paul wrote. This would be so encouraging to me that I am actually useful service to this man who at one time told me I was no useful service whatsoever. I don't want you to go with me. That's how unuseful you are. And again, this shows not only Timothy's faithfulness, God's faithfulness, because he takes all of us I mean, we're, I mean, Ross gave me a, a blessed introduction, and I very much thank you, you know, for that. For I tell you, <laughs> God knows. He knows all of us. You know, ups and downs. I'm not talking about abandoning the faith, but just two steps forward, three steps back, one step to the side, think I've made it from here, and have an argument with the wife type thing. After, uh, we're in the process of working, all of us are in the process of growing in the grace, hopefully growing in the grace and knowledge. And I promise you this, I am, having done this 31 years, I am so different than the day that I first was saved. Mark is too, by this particular point. Pick him up, he is of useful service to me. Now, it is with this that we come to, we come to the gospel of Mark. ta plump my pumpkin, and wouldn't that be, now if we did not do what we did before, boy, if we had just started with Mark chapter 1, we would have left out a lot of light of the revelation to God's word, Right? And so we're going to go now to Mark's gospel and actually hang in there and stay in there for the most part. We'll be in there. But Mark's gospel, chapter 1. Let's just do a few of the characteristics out of Mark's gospel. Kind of a few things to know what we are dealing with with this. Mark's gospel is going to be a rapid, fast-paced account Rapidity, fastness of pace. If you were going to do this in the Roman time and they were going to do a promo for the gospel of Mark, it would be your action-packed adventure movie. It would be this, I I hate to even say what it would be because I don't even know what's out there now. Whatever it is, action-packed. I know stuff that I grew up watching, y'all probably wouldn't have watched way back when, but just Star Wars, how about that? I happen to know the, the I'll, t- I'll tell you a break, I don't want to reveal <laughs> beyond that. All right, Star Wars, when it came out, when they showed the Prova, I was in college when Star Wars came out. That was an action-packed adventure movie, right? A lot of action, a lot, you zipping through, you're watching all this stuff. I did, some people, it changed your life forever. I don't see it that way, but... <laughs> But Mark's gospel is going to be like that. It moves swiftly from one event to another. Mark is going to omit the genealogy of Jesus completely. Mark omits the birth of Jesus. Minor details like that. And again, all under the Holy Spirit. Has Matthew do the birth? Has Luke do the birth? Mark's gospel, he doesn't. It's too fast-paced. I mean, you've got 13 verses of introduction. That's a very small amount of introduction. And then you're going to go into the, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark's account is going to give the vividness of details. A lot of times it's going to be done in the sense of an eyewitness who was there. 
Now, beloved, what we have seen before, well, I'll go ahead and tell you this. If God wanted Mark to write the gospel of Mark and set Mark off on some island in the middle of nowhere and the Holy Spirit wanted him to produce that particular book, God, that's been a problem for God. It's not a problem at all. But in the same way with us, God and his sovereignty to bring Mark and Peter together. Remember what we saw in 1 Peter 5.13, my, you know, my son Mark in the faith. The gospel of Mark has a lot of times, it's got, the, it's got the gestures of Jesus. It's got the facial expressions of Jesus. Again, the Holy Spirit could do this by himself if he wanted to. But a lot of times he will take the human events, and this would be one that we, I would say would be Peter's input. So when you're reading the Gospel of Mark, a lot of times you're going to have Peter's input. It's very picturesque in the language. For instance, when the 5,000 are fed, uh, the word for flower beds are used. For That's how the people look. They had the people set up in little sections. They used the word, instead of sections, they used the word flower bed to be springtime. Because it would be different colors and different people. That's an eyewitness account. You're going to have in Mark's gospel the emotions of Jesus. Anger. Grieved in his heart. He is going to be very tender at times. And so as though somebody is right there witnessing all these things, and in all likelihood, Peter was the one. Again, all of this is under the Holy Spirit's design. Mark happened to be the human agent that God designed to bring about this epistle. It's a short epistle. And again, with the gospel, you know, some people just call it the gospel of action. There's only one long teaching discourse when you're going through Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 13 is the longest teaching discourse of Jesus. You've got 18 miracles recorded in the gospel of Mark. 18 miracles, but only four parables. You'll have much more teaching in the gospel of John, much more teaching in certain sections than Luke's gospel. Much more teaching in Matthew's gospel. But Mark's gospel, boy, you're off to the races when you read the gospel of Mark. It is written primarily to a Gentile audience. Better still, it is written to a Roman audience of that day. Because after all, from a Roman standpoint, how strong a God can this be? His own people rejected him. He was a god and he was crucified. How could this be? Roman audience would appreciate power. Would appreciate authority. And we're going to see power and authority in the gospel of Mark. We're going to see it in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to run into a word that's going to be very, very common as we do our study. The word immediately, immediately occurs 41 times in the Gospel of Mark. It's not like eight times in chapter one, and immediately this, and immediately this, and immediately this. And so it's going from one event to another event to another event. And I tell you what, you are going to see, you think your schedule is busy, and it is, and my schedule is busy. When you read the Gospel of Mark, you've got the crowds hemming in on Jesus. You've got the multitudes surrounding him. Sometimes they don't even have time to stop and eat. They're, Jesus is so busy. He has to go find a lonely place to pray because the multitudes upon multitudes are just going to swarm in upon him. He is going to be very, very, very busy. And an action-packed gospel, you would expect action-packed in this life. And so he is going to be, you'll see him highly working, highly doing a, 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 the activities that God has intended. Gospel of Matthew presents Jesus as the promised king of the Jews, still is, king, Messiah, would be almost interchangeable words. 
When you go to the Gospel of Matthew, it has Old Testament support, find Old Testament support, Old Testament support. Dozens and dozens and dozens of Old Testament references. Mark presents Jesus as the promised servant. Not a king, but a servant. If you wanted to continue this, Luke presents it as the perfect man. Takes the genealogy from Luke 3 backwards to Adam in Luke 3. On to the temptation in Luke 4. That Adam fell, Jesus did not. So Matthew, you had to have a genealogy to show that you were the king, the promised Messiah. Luke, to go back to identify uh, with manhood, the perfect man, goes back to Adam. John presents Jesus as God. No genealogy needed with God. No kind of time frame you have with God. But this is important in studying the gospel of Mark. Mark is presented as a servant, and a servant's genealogy is unimportant. Not part of those, I mean, it's important to him or her. But here's the big thing with this. Not only is Jesus presented as a servant, he was presented as the servant of Yahweh. In fact, the prophesied servant of Yahweh. So not just a servant in general, although he was a servant. He's the servant of Yahweh. If we were going to do, say, 20 sessions or 25 sessions, we would go over to the book of Isaiah and go through the servant songs. And they're not really songs. Somebody called them servant songs way back when, and it stuck. But there are four of them that talk about the servant of Yahweh. If you want the most famous one, Isaiah 53 would be the fourth one. And you can find MacArthur's study Bible. You've got all kinds of ways to find out what the four servant songs are. But we would put it this way. Isaiah and the Gospel of Mark play a big, big part side by side with each other. Jesus is fulfilling scripture. And this, again, with a Gentile background, you're not going to have many Old Testament quotes in there. This is going to be very good to use as an evangelistic book. Because that's a big part of how this was presented. Very much an evangelistic book. And a lot of use out of that. But if you were to go deeper in the studies as we are able to, this side of the cross and this side of God's word, then you would find that the gospel of Mark and the servant of Yahweh are going to be very much intertwined with this. And most of them are not going to understand that he is the servant of Yahweh. Now, this is a perfect gospel to give to a Gentile. Perfect gospel to hand to someone. You can read the gospel of Mark in one sitting, 16 chapters. And depending on how fast you read and how much you're trying to absorb and how many notes you're trying to take. But the gospel of Mark is handable. I teach the, I call it the gospel of Isaiah uh, at the Master's Seminary. Uh, our accrediting board would call it the book of Isaiah. But it really is the gospel of Isaiah. Boy, you'll see Jesus all over the place in Isaiah. But in doing this, and when we do this, one of the hardest things that people have, 66 chapters, how in the world do you get your arms around mentally 66 chapters? And what we do is break it up into segments that people can contain. I have students to this day, I have one, uh, every time I'd walk by, he would do... 1 through 5 of Isaiah 6, 7 through 12, 13 through 23, 24 through 27, 28 through 30. He's doing the outline of Isaiah that we did in class because he's doing this in different chunks, kind of like with a railroad train going across there. And you take the 66 chapters and you work it down into chunks that you can get your arms around. And a year or two after class, this guy was walking by just going through the, the breakdown of Isaiah from memory. We had done it so much in class that he was doing it just kind of as an encouragement, doing it from memory with us. 
You don't have to do that with the Gospel of Mark. Because you've got 16 chapters. There are going to be very definitive points of division in there. Very definitive ways that things are going to go. But most people do not have that hard of a time getting their arms around thinking about reading 16 chapters. You know, there are rich chapters and there are loaded chapters. There are Holy Spirit inspired chapters. But this was given to the Gentile world. Now, beloved with us, one little caveat off to the side. This does not mean that God does not want we as Gentiles to study the other Gospels. He does want us to. All Scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for this, for doctrine, for proof, correction, for training in righteousness. What happens, as it was been mentioned before last night and many, many different times, when you're taking the different Gospels, it's almost like you're taking a diamond and you're holding it up to the light and then turning it. And you're turning it, and you're turning it, and you get a different view, a different gleam come out. The Gospel of Mark is going to be highly evangelistic, it's going to be very usable in the Gentile world. Now, we need to very, very briefly, let me step over here, modern technology. Now, some of those will live in darkness. We'll see a great light with this when we take a break in just a minute. But the outline, the Gospel of Mark, is a very kind of hard to do in a way. I'm trying to do this so you can see it. Also trying to do this so I don't rip my Achilles. Um, if I can get to heaven without ripping my Achilles, that will be a good thing. I have come so close to Achilles. So anyway, outer man decay it with us. Here we go. Ta-da! <laughs> now that's actually one of the best ones I've ever done in my life. God has given grace. Now beloved, with this, this will not make, we're going to build this. This will not make sense at the proper time. I'm going to put a line right here, and I'm going to put Mark chapter 10. Louise, in your prayer group, I'm so sorry you're on that side. I'm just going to tell you what I'm writing. You can write it too if you want to. We've got one coming forward. We've had a revival. We've had one come forward. <laughs> I see that hand. Is there another? <laughs> ah, sister. Come on up here, everyone. <laughs> okay, boy. Is the Holy Spirit moving anybody else? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And again, we'll just, we'll make this, and you'll, and you'll get this a bit later. Mark chapter 10 is a journey to Jerusalem. And that's an important thing. It's the journey to Jerusalem. It is the journey to Jerusalem that is going to end up with the death of the servant of Yahweh. Because what happens with the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark, Gospel of Luke, is that very definitive ways that God does this. With the Gospel of Mark, the outline is developed. And think this, this is very logical. If this is an action-packed Gospel then it would make sense to do the background, to do the outline in a geographical format, right? In other words, we're going to let the geography determine the outline. Now, through modern technology, I'm going to do something. I think I am. No, maybe not. I hope I don't lose this. I'm going to do something. What do we have? No. Israel. Israel. <laughs> right? Right? Mediterranean Sea. Egypt. Down here. Let me put down a little bit. Sea, sea of Galilee. Jordan River. Dead Sea. Jerusalem would be somewhere around here. Galilee. 
Uh, roughly speaking, let's put it this way. Galilee is going to play a major, major part in the Gospel of Mark. Galilee was the northern part. Galilee is agricultural country. No schools of any notoriety, no universities up in Galilee. Can anything good come out of Nazareth, a little city in Galilee? Jerusalem would be where the scribes would be, the Pharisees would be, the rabbis would be, the Herodians would be, the Sadducees, high priests and such. All of them are trained in Jerusalem. Now, I mentioned this, and it's worth mentioning again in case you didn't get it last night. This is important. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, a southern town. Jesus is eternally born a southerner. You need to know that. That's worth the trip in for you to know that. He was born a southerner. Now, Galilee was Yankee territory. Galilee, up here, is where he's going to spend most of his life, most of his ministry as well, at least to begin with. And so when we come to the book of Matthew, we are going to have the geography. Let me go ahead. I'll put this as best I can. Hang in there, Achilles. We'll come back to this. 1, 1 through 13 is the introduction. Boy, I hope my backside looks good on video. We may have to do some. We may have to do some photoshopping type thing. I have no idea. We'll just let it go to outer man to kids with uh, the introduction part. So, for instance, when Jesus begins, we'll see this. But when we develop the outline, the chapter divisions, Galilee is going to play a very, very important part with this. Now, we will do that in our next session. This is where we will pick up. Now, if you will, get with your prayer partners and... Two or three things that you have learned about this, and then we'll come back up for air, and we'll be ready for lunch in just one moment, and we'll make sure everybody has this. So if you get with your prayer partners, five minutes, and then we'll come back, and off we go.